Hello everyone, I'm Russo. I'm pursuing my PhD in Cognitive Science at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and Dr. Wayne Gray is my advisor. The focus of our research together is understanding how an individual learns a complex task with practice. According to the famed power law of learning by Alan Newell and Paul Rosenblum, the individual human should monotonically and continuously improve with practice until reaching the limit of performance, namely the asymptote. However, several work showed that the power law relationship emerges only in the average performance of a group of individuals, while the individuals themselves go through numerous ups and downs of performance. To illustrate the mismatch between average and individual curves, we are going to use data from the game of Space Fortress. So let us first take a quick look at the game and also how novice versus expert performance looks like in it. Space Fortress was developed in 1989 by Manen Dungeon to create a task sufficiently complex to test human limits. Possibly the developers overplayed their hand a little bit as some participants found the task so difficult they had to be removed from the experiment altogether. The complexity arises from the multiplicity of the tasks, the specificity of the ways they have to be performed, and interconnections across tasks, for example, sharing resources. The player's task is to fly the ship, which is a yellow plane-like object, around the fortress located at the center of the screen to fight with the fortress and its minions, the mines, which are the blue diamond-like objects periodically spawning at random locations and homing in on the player's ship. As can be seen, the novice player seems quite clueless, he is struggling to control the ship and therefore is not being able to really fight the fortress. On the other hand, the expert player certainly looks like on a mission, flying in planned paths of circles, shooting periodically and frequently, and deviating from the plan only to deal with the mines. Actually, both of these demonstrations are from the same player, the left showing a game very early in practice and the right after lots of practice. What we are interested in is how does one become from being this to this? Now we will look at the performance curves of nine players who played 248 games of Space Fortress over 31 hours in our lab. Here is the average performance of the group, which looks perfect, almost waiting to be fitted with a power function as such. But we refrain from doing so because the individual performance looks like this. The individual curves show many, many ups and downs while there are hardly any in the average curve. Then how well the average is representing the individuals? As it seems, not quite well. While averaging over groups, individual differences are being treated as random noise, while some portion of it may very well be systematic. When we look for the systematic variations, yes, we do have to be careful against fitting random noise, but we must also retain the information first, which averaging is not allowing us to do. Therefore, we took a different approach. We adopted the Plateau Zips and Leaps framework developed by Gray and Linson, a framework that captures three systematic deviations in the ups and downs of individual performances. In this talk, I will discuss our efforts to extract the information hidden in these Plateau Zips and Leaps during an individual's learning and conclude with some findings and promising, promising directions for future in terms of understanding individual learning. A reason why the average does not represent the individuals well is the presence of task execution methods or strategies as a factor to performance in addition to practice. For example, expert performers are observed to use more effective methods than novices do. Several works showed a strong source of individual differences to be in these individual methods and accordingly three of them proposed revisions of the power law. These three works are, were done by respectively Rickard in 1997, Delany et al. in 1998, and Donner and Hurdy in 2015. The main theme of the revisions is that individual performance is better explained by multiple method specific power functions instead of one method independent function throughout the entire course of practice. In another relevant work, Hyder and French showed that the power functions can fit average performance really well, 
even when the individual performances are highly discontinuous underneath. They proved this by mathematical simulations and formulations and then concluded that the power functions are very robust against violations caused by sudden shifts in methods. Speaking of violations of the power law, the plateau zips and leaps framework points our researchers towards Vertilup, as it points out three divisions of the power law frequently observed in individual performances, therefore the plateaus, dips and leaps. Plateaus are spurious limits of performance that can be overcome, unlike the true limits of performance, which is called the asymptote. Plateaus result from using suboptimal methods. Therefore, to get out of plateau, a performer would need to explore his or her options and experiment with different combinations to come up with better methods. The performance is likely to drop during this period as a cause of experimentation, which is why we refer to it as a dip. And then, if or when successful in developing a new better method, we will see a leap in performance to get out of the plateau. To identify these periods of plateau zips and leaps, we have developed an information theory tool, the Spotlight. The basis of the Spotlight lies in a simple theorem of information theory, conditioning reduces uncertainty. In other words, uncertainty of outcomes decreases if we have more information about the conditions. For example, uncertainty of a coin toss reduces drastically if we know that the coin is double-headed and would always yield heads. In fact, the uncertainty just goes down to zero as we know the result. For skill acquisition, we rephrase this theorem a little bit. With gain of expertise, uncertainty of choices would reduce. Using this principle, to capture the systematic changes in uncertainty, we instrumented the spotlight with relative entropy. Relative entropy is a measure of the difference between the states of uncertainty of two probability distributions. For the spotlight, we extend the scope of comparison from two distributions to any finite number of distributions. Specifically, first we set a common reference in a stable phase of performance to compare with all phases of performance. This way, this, the common reference being stable would have no systematic variations but both the reference and the targets would have random variations. As relative entropy is the difference between two states of uncertainty, the random variations would be cancelled out from each other and only the systematic variations would be captured. The result is that the power law-like improvements would be depicted by a continuous, continual reduction of relative entropy and the plateaus, dips and leaps as exceptions from this trend. More specifically, the plateaus would be detected by unchanging relative entropy, the dips by brief increases in entropy, and the leaps by sharp sudden decreases of relative entropy. As an example of the application of a spotlight tool, we look at the best performer of the group. In this figure, the blue zigzagging line in the background show the raw total scores. The black dash curve is the best fit of the power law and the red line is the relative entropy curve. Please note that we actually flipped the axis of relative entropy which is shown on the right to match with the plateau zips and lips terminology and also to aid comparison with the raw total scores. Therefore the relative entropy that's decreasing in the upward direction. Here the relative entropy curve demonstrates a general trend of trend of continual but not continuous reduction reflecting the parallel like improvement just as we expected. In addition to that, the relative entropy curve also captures the deviations from the trend. The two biggest D plus leap pairs, the two biggest deviations from the power law, are highlighted in this figure. During the first dip shown in green, the player experimented with different flight paths to finally discover and adopt the optimal flight path of circles that helps to deal with the fortress and results in the subsequent leap here. We identified these changes of methods by applying the spotlight on progressively lower level measures. For example, after the total score, which is shown in here, we examined its four constituent scores for concurrent deep and leap periods and so on and so on until we went down to the level of key presses. I'm skipping these steps for the sake of brevity, but I will show the player's expeditions with the flight path in an animation very shortly. Before that, I will reveal the change in method that we observed in the second deep period, 
which was to just fly the ship slower. The slower velocity helps aim and shoot at the moving targets, the mines, hence the leap here. In this animation, the flight paths in each game will be shown. Please keep an eye for games 50 through 80, during which the player experimented exp extensively with flight paths. After trying out different paths, sometimes moving only on in short lines, sometimes in circles or half circles, the player eventually adopted the optimal path of circles. Interestingly, it's been long known that the circles are the way to go and the optimality was also mentioned in the instructions. Why then the player needed to experiment with flight paths? Perhaps the player simply needed to learn how to closely control the ship or perhaps he wanted to verify there exists no other flight paths better than the circles. The exact reason was indeterminable from the data we had, but the experiments were hard to miss. Now let us look at the two method modifications by our worst player. These two changes are shown by asterisks on the relative entropy curve. To be clear, this player was the worst in terms of the total score, but by no means in all measures of performance. In fact, he was one of the equally good top two in killing mines. As if to justify this very specific strength, at the first point, the player adopted the strategy of flying the ship slower, and that improved his mine killing performance considerably. But he was still performing poorly in other aspects of the game, for example, fighting against the fortress. The player was taking a lot of hits and dying while attacking the fortress, in return hitting the fortress only a few times after firing a lot of shots. To stop this leak of points, the player adopted a very strange strategy, which was to simply just stop interacting with the fortress, mind you, in a game called the Space Fortress, and focus only on killing the minions, the mines. This lazy strategy, despite its strangeness and suboptimality, resulted in a small leap of performance as there was differential gain from killing the mines and not killing the fortress. However, this is also true that with the lazy strategy, even with infinite amount of practice, player 2 would never reach the asymptote of performance as the power law would have suggested. To summarize, by putting the spotlight on the individual's routes to expertise, we observe that the individuals take very different routes. At an even level, the differences in these routes are characterized by the events of plateaus, dips, and leaps. In turn, these plateaus, dips, and leaps stem from individual differences of task execution methods and also the time and timing of using them. The individual differences exist both across participants and also over the course of learning. Therefore, these differences consist of both inter- and intra-individual components. These routes from novice to expertise are so different that it seems implausible that there could exist one simple description like the power law that could explain all individual cis learning, especially if we consider practice as the only factor and not take task execution methods into the mix. So if we can't achieve a common description for all, how can we proceed towards the general laws of individual learning? As it turns out, Underneath the vast individual differences of methods, there also lie some commonalities across individuals in modifying those methods. We find that our nine players recurrently updated their methods to address the weakest links of performance. By weakest, we mean the scope in the game with the biggest potential gain in points. Once they address the present weakest link, they move on to the next and so on and so on. We name this rule as the design for the weakest link rule. As an example of this rule, player 7 first adopted the optimal flight path of circles and then afterwards went on to adopt the optimal velocities. The gain from the first change was considerably higher than the second. Later on, he would also make some more refinements, which would result in even smaller gains each time. This was true for almost all of the gains from the method changes that we detected for all of our nine players. Moreover, generally the players apply the rule with a caveat. The modifications 
must reinforce or complement existing skills. An example is our worst player. Player to address the weakest link in his performance, wasting a lot of missiles to simultaneously deal with the fortress and the mines, by focusing on his strength of killing mines. This caveat suggests one reason for how individuals may get stuck and also remain stuck in performance plateaus due to suboptimal methods, that it is simply hard to abandon the hard-earned skills and start anew. Taken together, our findings indicate that there may not exist a simple function such as a power function that can explain all individuals' learning generally. But we also observe that while there may not be a common description for individuals' roots to expertise, but there may be common explanations for the progression of individual skill in the evolution of task execution methods. Therefore, in our future works, we plan to study individuals' processes of searching for, discovering, and adopting different methods in tasks other than space fortress to ultimately progress towards the general laws of individual learning. For example, currently we are studying individual performance in a different, much easier dynamic game, Pac-Man, to study the evolution of methods as the player learns about the regularities in game objects' behavior. Also, we would like to study learning mathematics using mathematical puzzle games like Sudoku or less popularly the game of 24, so that we know which pieces of information are learned to develop which uh, task execution methods in terms of solving math. So that was the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Gray, and also Dr. Sims, who has immensely helped me with this project. And then I would like to thank my family members for all their support. Hi, I'm Chris Sims. I'm an assistant professor in the Cognitive Science Department at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. The title of the symposium is New Measures for the Fundamentals of Human Performance. While I'm just one panelist and don't speak for the group, I still feel obligated to offer my own perspective on what the symposium is about. So to me, the symposium is about the idea that cognitive science is constantly searching for new and better frameworks. Critically, a framework is different than a theory or an experiment. It's a surrounding structure and a broader context in which to build a new theory or understand a new experiment. In this talk, I'll describe one particular framework, computational rationality, as well as my own research, which can be seen as working in one specific corner of this much larger framework. To start, this is one definition of computational rationality, although there are several. Simply stated, computational rationality is computing with representations, algorithms, and architectures designed to approximate decisions with the highest expected utility while taking into account the costs of computation. Right up front, it's important to note that this idea is neither a new one nor the work of any one ind individual. In my view, it's essentially the confluence of the ideas of four of the most influential people in the history of cognitive science. As a warm-up exercise, see if you can name each of these people. Hopefully you recognize these individuals as Alan Turing, Claude Shannon, Herbert Simon, and George Miller. To reduce their monumental achievements down to a pithy catchphrase each, Alan Turing both created the theory of computation as well as enabled the logical possibility of thinking machines with the idea that cognition can be understood as formalized information processing. Claude Shannon formalized the language and mathematics of information and allowed us to quantify the flow of information through a system, whether biological or artificial. Herbert Simon introduced the idea of bounded rationality, namely that human behavior is not best understood as maximizing expected utility, but rather as producing behavior that is good enough in the face of limited information and information processing constraints. And lastly, George Miller launched the field's obsession over the number seven but more importantly, he demonstrated that Shannon's information theory is not an abstract mathematical idea, but rather a very real constraint 
on the ability for human minds to store and process information. There's much that can be said about computational rationality, and fortunately, much has been said elsewhere. So highlighted here are four recent papers that, in my view, are particularly worth reading, and full citations uh, will be given at the end of this talk. As I said, in this talk, I'll be focusing on a particular flavor of computational rationality that builds in particular on the contributions of both Claude Shannon and George Miller. You can call this framework information-theoretic computational rationality. The idea is this. Human cognition seeks to maximize the expected utility of behavior subject to a cost or constraint on the ability to store, manipulate, and transmit information. This idea is formalized using a branch of mathematics known as rate distortion theory, a name that's admittedly ungainly for what turns out to be a pretty elegant theory. In this talk, I'll only have time to briefly describe the framework and highlight three case studies. Most people watching this have probably at least heard of Miller's Magical Number 7 paper. In this paper, George Miller proposed the idea of measuring cognition in terms of an information channel between a stimulus and response. A key ingredient in his approach is a quantity called mutual information. The formula is given here, but in plain English, if human perceivers are information channels, then mutual information measures the average amount of information transmitted between a stimulus S and the behavioral response R. What Miller demonstrated is that there is an apparent constraint on this quantity. Although you can increase the complexity of stimuli without limit, the ability for a human to perceive and convey information about a stimulus quickly saturates. To George Miller, information was a constraint. The additional ingredient in computational rationality is the idea of optimization of behavior in terms of maximizing its expected utility. Putting these two pieces together, information theory and expected utility theory, computational rationality boils down to a single simple idea. Cognition seeks to maximize expected utility with respect to behavior subject to a constraint on the capacity to process information. The first case study to illustrate this framework comes from the study of visual working memory. A common experimental paradigm in visual working memory research is the delayed recall paradigm. In this kind of experiment, subjects are shown a number of sample stimuli followed by a memory retention interval and then are cued to recall one of the sample items in this case, reporting its color along a continuous color wheel. The common finding in this paradigm is known as the set size effect. When there is only a single stimulus to remember, memory precision is high, but as the number of stimuli increases, the set size, memory precision decreases. Information theoretic computational rationality suggests that we treat memory as an optimal but capacity limited system. In this view, the goal for memory is to maximize the expected utility of memory representations subject to an information constraint. In the absence of this constraint, visual memory would simply perfectly encode and represent the visual world, but for finite systems, this is physically impossible. Therefore, information theory predicts a priori the existence of set size effects. Over the span of several papers, Myself and colleagues have shown that this approach not only accounts for existing data, but it also generates novel predictions that have been borne out by subsequent experiments. For example, rate distortion theory predicts that the probability distribution of errors in memory depends on the cost of particular errors. If certain errors are more costly, then those errors should be less likely to occur. That much is intuitively obvious. However, the theory goes beyond that and predicts quantitatively how the cost of error relates to both information capacity and the predicted frequency of different types of memory error. Building on this work, I've also applied the idea of information theoretic computational rationality to the domain of perceptual generalization. As noted by Roger Shepard, generalization is critical for all intelligent behavior. For example, if a bird eats a particular insect, it needs to generalize that experience in order to decide if a different insect is also edible. The need for generalization is simple. 
no organism ever encounters the exact same situation twice. Shepard's major contribution in this area is to show that the functional form of generalization is not arbitrary, but rather follows a seemingly universal pattern across a huge range of exa examples. Shepard argued that generalization and perception follows an exponential function of distance in so-called psychological space. That is, stimuli that are psychologically similar have a high probability to generalize from one stimulus to another. The question is what computational mechanism accounts for this phenomenon? While Shepard proposed one class of explanation, it turns out that information theoretic computational rationality offers another. In particular, for an organism with limited information processing capacity, it's impossible to achieve perfect perceptual discriminability. There will always be a non-zero probability of confusing one stimulus with another. What matters is the cost of confusion. For example, a blue jay might eat a toxic monarch butterfly. If it survives and learns its lesson, it needs to discriminate between toxic monarch butterflies and other types of butterflies because there is a cost for failing to do so. It turns out that rate distortion theory allows you to formalize this intuition. And with minimal assumptions, it turns out that rate distortion theory also predicts the exponential pattern observed by Shepard. As in the case of visual working memory, the new approach also makes unique predictions. For example, the cost of perceptual error can be asymmetric. The cost of confusing a toxic butterfly with an edible butterfly is very different than the cost of confusing an edible butterfly with a toxic one. These asymmetries predict asymmetries in generalization, which have also been de demonstrated empirically in accordance with the theory. One last case study in our whirlwind tour. So much of what I've been talking about revolves around the optimality of behavior. In both cognitive science and machine learning, reinforcement learning is an influential framework for understanding how intelligent agents learn to improve their behavior through trial and error. The question I've become interested in exploring is what constitutes a computationally rational theory of reinforcement learning? As an example of the kind of behavior I'm interested in explaining, consider the simple instrumental learning paradigm used by Ann Collins and Michael Frank. In this paradigm, subjects are presented on each trial with a stimulus and select one of three possible actions. For each stimulus, there's an optimal action to perform. Subjects have to learn through trial and error a stimulus response mapping in order to maximize their monetary payoff. This particular experiment is interesting because in different blocks of the experiment, the researchers manipulated the number of stimuli in the training set. What they found is that subjects show a strong set size effect. Namely, as the number of stimuli increases, the optimality of their policy degrades, even when controlling for the amount of experience with each stimulus. This is exactly like the set size effect we just saw in the domain of visual working memory. And importantly, this effect is not predicted by off-the-shelf reinforcement learning algorithms. My lab has been developing a new family of reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, these algorithms are designed to be computationally rational. That is, they explicitly balance the optimality of behavior against the information complexity of learning. Either surprisingly or not surprisingly, depending on your perspective, these algorithms show such set size effects and are able to closely capture the empirical details of human reinforcement learning. The surprising part to me is that this behavior emerges by assuming the same exact notion of computational rationality, that is, optimality subject to a particular constraint, one imposed by information theory. If you're registered for the Math Psych Conference this year, you can watch the presentation by my PhD student, Siming Fang, and get uh, mathematical details of this approach. At the same time, I really believe that computational rationality is not just a theory of human minds, it's also a theory of machine intelligence. In parallel with our work exploring human reinforcement learning, we're also developing new algorithms for machine learning based on the idea of information theoretic computational rationality. You might wonder, why deliberately impose constraints on machines? 
wouldn't unlimited capacity algorithms be better than limited capacity algorithms? We believe that there may be a functional advantage to having information theoretic constraints. The idea relates closely to the work I previously described in perceptual generalization. Consider a machine learning system learning to play the game Pac-Man. On one episode, Pac-Man gets eaten by a red ghost. The challenge is to generalize from this past experience to new situations. Should Pac-Man move towards or away from a blue ghost on the next episode? Existing machine learning algorithms are terrible at this type of generalization, but they can be improved. My grad students, Rachel Lurch and Tyra Malloy, have shown how imposing information theory constraints on reinforcement learning can actually improve its ability to generalize to new situations and learn behavioral policies that are more robust against changes to the environment. The details of this are more involved than I have time to go into, but I encourage you to read more details in the references given here. The message I want to leave you with is that computational rationality is a promising framework for understanding intelligence and building models of intelligence, whether it's biological or artificial. I've highlighted here several of my own contributions, but there's so much more room to build. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. I would also like to thank my PhD students, Rachel Lurch, Ziming Fang, and Tyler Malloy for the hard work and insight in this line of research. And I'd also like to thank my fellow panel members and the funding agencies that have supported this research. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Torres. I'm an associate professor at Rutgers University and uh, the psychology department. And I'm going to be talking today about stochastic shifts in learning performance across the lifespan. Human performance um, is quite complex, and uh, in recent years, we've been able to leverage the wearable sensor revolution to go beyond uh, human observation uh, into a higher level of granularity um, involving the activities, the self-generated uh, activities from the nervous systems that the sensors can record. However, with uh, this new technology, uh, we have noted several challenges using the time series data that the sensors offer. Among them are multi-layered and multi-modal data, different sampling resolutions, different time scales and frequency sampling scales, uh, different physical units from different types of sensors, uh, data loss uh, owing to uh, grand averaging techniques uh, under uh, a priori assumptions of certain probability distributions. Uh, the presence of different anatomical sizes that impact the motion that the sensors collect and uh, the need for a uh, standardized uh, waveform that uh, can be integrated across different layers uh, of these multimodal systems. Um, and in particular, uh, the shift in uh, age-dependent probability landscape that arises from the uh, different signatures of variability that we uh, explore under different contextual situations. An example of uh, these challenges is used here um, to illustrate uh, some of the problems <laughs> using the hand uh, speed motion, the linear speed of the hand uh, derived from movements to a target, uh, to an instructed target. Um, and what is typically done is a superimposition of epochs from the data uh, they are de defined by specific uh, behavioral landmarks and a grand averaging uh, under an assumed theoretical mean, uh, which then incurs in loss of gross data and throws away uh, important fluctuations, what turn out to be important fluctuations as noise. Our approach is different uh, in that we take a continuous time series data, um, say across a day or different days or so on, and uh, take a sliding windows that uh, where we track the fluctuations away from an empirically estimated mean shift over time and uh, considers these 
uh, fluctuations in the amplitude of the peaks or in the end or in the uh, time inter-peak time interval <coughs> intervals in the data. And then from there, we derive a standardized waveform uh, spanning from zero to one unit list, uh, which takes care of allometric effects owing to uh, different anatomical features across different subjects in different ages, different states of maturation, and we call these the micro-movement spikes. Spikes because we derive them from the peaks uh, in, the, in the raw data. And we applied these to all sorts of different uh, sensors, uh, different biorhythms from the nervous system. Uh, we then uh, group them in a frequency histogram and use maximum likelihood estimation with high confidence, 95% confidence intervals to estimate rather than assume uh, an empirically um, derived uh, continuous family of probability distributions functions. Uh, in this case, we've uh, found that the gamma family uh, does a good job at characterizing human uh, performance in general. And in this way, we shift from a one-size-fits-all approach with a grand averaging uh, under some statistics to a personalized model that uh, specifically tailors um, the analysis of behavior to these uh, stochastic signatures that are unique to each individual. Uh, uh, these movements are quite uh, overt, they're visible, and uh, we can describe them visibly um, by observation, but there are a number of uh, family of movements that are occur largely beneath awareness and we can't and beyond the detection of the naked eye. And one of them, for example, occurs quite often uh, when people try to curtail their movements in the magnet during the resting state of fMRI. Uh, data and by now there are open access databases that provide this type of data for analysis and so in seemingly resting state where there is a quite a lot of motion of involuntary movements that we can also analyze using the micro movement spikes approach. Uh, so we take for example a child, a neurotypical child and, a, and an autistic child and we can see uh, profound differences in the amount of motion that they, that their body uh, outputs and that they head. Uh, um, uh, registers and uh, using the micro movements approach, we can then estimate the uh, stochastic signatures using the gamma probability uh, family and uh, plot each child in a gamma parameter space spanned by the shape and the scale of the distribution. This is uh, upon uh, gathering all those peaks in, in frequency histograms and fitting using maximum likelihood estimation. And using the shape and the scale, we can then plot these points in a gamma moments parameter space and study large cohorts as they uh, stratify. Um, we can take these micro movements as vibrations and convert them to sound and play them back to the system and examine in closed loop and causally how that type of music, which is system self-generated, influences uh, cognitive activities and um, do so at other layers um, of neuromotor control, including the autonomic nervous system uh, here uh, instantiated by the EKG's uh, signal uh, time series that we can uh, extract the micro movements from uh, the R peaks. Uh, um, and uh, examine them under different uh, levels of cognitive load. You can go beyond time uh, uh, domain analysis into the frequency domain analysis uh, and, and examine how the brain is sensing these uh, vibrations kind of statically and, and, and explore different frequency bands that uh, haven't been explored because now we have, uh, with the wearable sensor revolution, we have high sampling resolution that we can uh, further uh, go beyond what we know about the, the physiology of the motor system. We were inspired by the uh, original work of von Holst and Mitte Seide in the 1950s. Uh, and in their own words, I, I quote that voluntary movements show themselves to be dependent on the returning stream of afferents which they themselves cause. This is known as the principle of reafference and uh, of kinesthetic reafference. Of 
And uh, what we have uh, non-trivially added to it is a set of movements that occur largely beneath, beneath awareness that are not necessarily voluntary under voluntary control, uh, but that contribute, we hypothesize, uh, to action, to the emergence of action ownership and the sense of agency in uh, precognitive uh, states uh, of infancy. Uh, and uh, that enable the brain to understand cause and effect. And so we can, uh, using this approach, uh, shift from a, a completely uh, correlation-based analysis to a causation uh, analysis and understanding how the nervous system interacts with the environment and how intelligent behavior self-emerges autonomously. We pair this uh, paradigm with the phylogenetic taxonomy of motor control maturation as studying both top-down influences and bottom-up influences from uh, the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system and map those uh, levels of voluntary, involuntary, and autonomic control to three fundamental types of muscle uh, tissues that innervate uh, that uh, occur across all organs in our body and are responsible for voluntary, involuntary, and autonomic control, and that um, uh, have a specific uh, genes uh, expression to it. So in this way, we have connected uh, all the way from uh, complex uh, performance to uh, phenotypic behaviors to tissues that have genomic and proteomics expression that we can quantify uh, all within uh, the personalized medicine approach. An example of an experimental essay that we have used in autism is a simple pointing paradigm, which we illustrate here in, in the simplest biomechanical form, a baseline state of point, uh, bringing the hand to the target of an instruction and then uh, without instruction spontaneously retracting the hand. And so we have two faces, the deliberate and the spontaneous faces, contributing differently uh, to the feedback that we get from the kinesthetic reafference. And um, elaborating some more this paradigm, we add match to sample task, we add the layer of decision making with different le levels of cognitive load that influence uh, our motions. And we can see here the evolution uh, of the co cognitive load that caused motor learning and adaptation. And over practice, we, we can then study uh, how the system adapts and how the system learns and how the system becomes um, uh, better at decision making, better accuracy, better timing, and so forth, both in neurotypical and in autistic children. Here is an example of a minimally verbal autistic child who performs, learns to perform this, this task uh, first with a lot of support and eventually with self-volition, um, self-initiating the movement and uh, with uh, high autonomy. So in the initial stages, we teach the child all types of things involving eye-hand coordination and uh, the, the mapping between a stimulus response. But more uh, importantly, we, we teach them the, consequ the sensory consequences of his self-generated actions and of uh, the actions that he receives support from. We do this in the context of uh, reinforcement learning where we uh, reward the child after every trial. And then after a few weeks, uh, the child performs this task on its own, entirely um, self volition. So his intent is, is now uh, mapped to his uh, volitional control. And he can, uh, we can, it's a very rich uh, setup, so we can study both decision-making continuously beyond uh, mouse clicks or binary states uh, as a continuous uh, random process. Here is an example of uh, hand trajectories uh, in route to the target and away from it, uh, studying the deliberate and the spontaneous motions uh, automatically extracted from the continuous uh, stream of data. Uh, and so we look at the peaks and valleys and when we gather them in a frequency histogram, we see fundamental differences between the typical and the autistic system. Uh, in particular, the autistic system we discover that has the presence of the memory as random exponential distribution. And then we further uh, study, align the, 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 the movement to the touch and plotted the, the speed profiles and realized that when we stock up all these 100 trials that the child performed, uh, in the typical case, there is a uh, high predictability, there's periodic behavior 
whereby um, uh, previous events are, can be used to anticipate um, impending events. And if this is not the case in autism, where we have the presence uh, of, a, of a high randomness and high noise. And so this is a system with high uncertainty and uh, in, the frame, in the framework of uh, kinesthetic reference, this system cannot possibly feel at ease. We, we can safely infer that uh, given the high uncertainty. We then uh, study this continuously um, as a continuous waveform throughout the day and we can track the stochastic shifts uh, using uh, the gamma probability distribution, which uh, does a good job at modeling uh, empirically the human uh, performance uh, data. And in this sense, we, we have uh, sampled by now thousands of individuals and characterized the gamma probability um, uh, parameter space of shape and scale, uh, uh, examine the noise to signal ratio, which happens to be the scale or the dispersion parameter the gamma and uh, discover that this should be our target for uh, interventions in autism and in other uh, disorders of the nervous system because here's where the uh, neurotypical system is aiming for a symmetric distribution with low uh, noise to signal ratio uh, enabling um, the prediction of impending uh, sensory consequences to compensate for internal sensory motor sensory transduction transmission delays we then uh, did um, have the opportunity to carry on a cross-sectional study from three to 25 years of age and examine the uh, trajectory of maturation of, this, of the nervous system in terms of the noise to signal ratio and the types of distributions that we, that we see. And it found out that in the typical development uh, from three to four years of age, there is the presence of the exponential distribution, but these shifts around the school age into a fundamentally different um, regime. And by college, uh, there is a symmetric distribution uh, quite common, but in autism, this is not the case. And we can see this represented in the, in the log log uh, gamma uh, shape uh, scale parameter, which spans a power law as it turns out, uh, representing the maturation of the nervous system and localizes each uh, age group um, quite distinctively in the typical case, but not, not in the autistic case. Here we can characterize empirically the different regimes and in autism they are absent. And so we can define a target for treatment in uh, using the noise to signal ratio, which we have uh, obtained proof of concept for in an intervention that is uh, beyond the scope of this work. But you can ask me about it if you, if you so uh, desire. Um, this uh, work defined a maturation path uh, in, in humans, uh, defined a target for treatment in an age-dependent probability space in ASD. Now, this is under voluntary control, but how about involuntary movements that are beneath awareness? So we went back to thousands of participants in uh, resting state fMRI and discovered that indeed uh, there is a systematic shift in um, noise to signal ratio and towards the exponential random uh, distribution with the use of uh, psychotropic medications. And um, in addition to that, we examine uh, thousands of individuals for, from five to 65 years of age and discovered that they have different um, stochastic trajectories on the gamma moment space. And uh, by the age of 40, there is a large departure from the neurotypical nervous system and indeed uh, the literature reports that there is a high incidence of Parkinsonism after 40 in autism. So in conclusion, uh, I have presented to you a new standardized data type, the micromovement spikes, a new taxonomy of phylogenetic maturation empirically tested, a new personalized method of a stochastic analysis, and an age-dependent probability landscape revealing target for treatment in autism. And in general, we offer a unifying framework to study human performance across the lifespan. I want to thank our multiple sources of funding and our prior uh, students and postdocs and our current members of the lab. Thank you for attending uh, our talk. Hi, I'm Travis Wiltshire. I'm an assistant professor in the Cognitive Science and AI department at Tilburg University of the Netherlands. Today, I'm gonna to talk about a social coordination dynamics approach 
to investigating collaborative interactions. I'm going to start this primarily by uh, focusing on what social coordination dynamics means and unpacking each of these terms, starting, of course, with the social. So in any interaction with others, whether it's uh, with our friends or whether we're working together in teams, there's a multi-scale mutual information exchange that occurs between interactors. Multi-scale essentially uh, means that there could be multiple uh, frequencies of interest in a signal. Uh, there's also a couple other meanings of this that I'll get to in a moment. But when we're thinking about collaborative interactions, what we know is that coordination necessarily has to span behavior and knowledge that can go across spatial and temporal scales, and that this occurs both within and between individuals. So social phenomena are fundamentally multimodal, and we can look for coordination and in in, in interaction across physiology, body movements, dialogue, and also, uh, if there's a technological system that scaffolds that interaction, we may see evidence of it there as well. So coordination fundamentally means the ways in which components and processes of a system change together over time. There's a lot of different terms uh, that could fall under coordination, like alignment, uh, synchronization, co-regulation, entrainment, and coupling. Essentially, uh, one way to get at the heart of this phenomena is what the Dutch naturalist Christian Huygens discovered, uh, which was that pendulums of wall clocks on ships tended to uh, synchronize in their oscillations. We would see this as well if we were to start 32 uh, metronomes and look at how their pendulums also begin to uh, oscillate in synchrony. And we may also see this when we look at uh, rowing crew teams and how they move in sync uh, to, to get the best time in a race. So what's important here when we're thinking about coordination is it, it manifests across physical and biological systems. Uh, but when we're thinking about collaborative context, we don't really know how coordination is functioning towards facilitating that interaction. So the next part of the social coordination dynamics approach is the dynamics. So thinking of social interactions as dynamical systems where we have a set of reciprocally interacting components uh, this could be individuals as well as subsystems within an individual. We know that there are also complex structures. So there's hierarchical and nested organizations uh, within and across individuals and that they change over time. So dynamics gets at the heart of this approach where uh, coordination of components can change. Uh, so some components may be uh, strongly coordinated and this can change or even break down altogether. And the last element is that we know that these systems are open, so they are influenceable by environmental factors. I'm going to revisit coordination a bit and talk about forms of coordination, uh, because there's two, at least two forms of coordination that are essential for this talk. So thinking about how systems exhibit states, when we want to understand human performance, we think about patterns of cognition or behavior or interaction or physiology that form, but also can change over time. So what's important is thinking about how coordination can be a degree of stability of a system, uh, and it could also be an amount of system order or disorder. So if a system is quite stable, we might see that uh, external influences on the system don't really move it around or change the state. Uh, but if it's a less stable system, then external forces could very easily change it to an alternative state. And these kind of changes can happen again from intrinsic interactions, so the component interactions of the system, as well as extrinsic forces uh, or perturbations to the system. And we know, of course, that some states may be better than others. And uh, we ultimately want to see, can we shift teams, for example, or people collaborating to more optimal patterns and guide them away from less optimal patterns? So just to unpack this in a bit more detail, there's a great paper in Memory and Cognition from Damien Kelty Stephen in 2009, uh, where essentially he looked at how entropy uh, could be used to track changes in system order or disorder. As a system moves from a highly ordered to a more disordered state, entropy uh, was actually able to indicate changes in the system as it's approaching a transition to a new organized state. So this is important as we apply it to look at how uh, collaborations uh, may unfold over time and whether they're changing or not. There's one more form of coordination I'm going to talk about, which is where most of the research looking at synchronization, for example, 
um, looks at this component coordination. So if we take an example from Emily Butler's nice paper on emotional coordination, we could think about how two people might be coordinating at the same time with their emotions, or there might be a lagged relationship that one thing that happens in one person at one time affects uh, another time for the next person. There can also be changes in level. So what's important here is thinking about how coordination can have different forms, uh, and we need to account for this in our research. Okay, so getting back to this idea of collaborative interactions, if I want to study how four people, for example, are working together to solve a complex problem, from a social coordination dynamics approach, there's really a lot of things I could look at. I could look at uh, movements, for example, accelerometers. I could look at properties of the speech or actually text that's generated from an interaction. I could look at physiological measures like heart rate or skin conductance, uh, technology interactions, questionnaires, of course, facial features and pose estimation. So this really gets at the heart of the complexity of this type of interactive data. And I hope that uh, my research will give an idea of how we can move forward with that. So I'm gonna focus on team coordination dynamics as an example of social coordination dynamics. And what's important I think for this field is to specify the modalities of investigation, what methods are used for our quantifying coordination, what form that coordination takes and how it functions in the interaction, essentially for facilitating effective collaboration. So I'm gonna focus on uh, two sets of results from one task of my research, which is the NASA Moon Base Alpha task. Here you can see, for example, uh, that there's a dyadic task where they work together to solve a complex uh, moon base scenario where they have to restore life support within 25 minutes. This is a really complex task and we have to think about how to quantify performance because not everyone is successful in it. So for performance, we quantify this as the total time taken to restore uh, life support, as well as the total percentage of oxygen restored. And then we also account for a ratio of object repairs from the total possible repairs. This is essentially a rescaled combination of the three variables. Um, and each team gets a score from zero to 100. And we do also use a grouping of low, medium, and high performance as well. So for the first uh, example, we look at changes in coordinated communication patterns and how those related to performance. What you see here in terms of modality is essentially a semantic uh, content of speech. So these were collaborative problem-solving processes, uh, things like knowledge sharing, uh, goal orientation, option generation. And we can see this in a time series. So what we do is we actually apply a sliding window entropy method to see if we could identify transition points in the team communications. So in this case, entropy is a information theoretic quantification of the amount of order or disorder in the system, where higher values of entropy suggest more disorder and peak points in particular suggest the system may be undergoing a transition. So what we did was we actually found that these peak points uh, separate distinct phases of collaborative cognition, or in other words, the phases in between the distribution of those categorical states was distinct. Not only this, but we found that lower average levels of entropy at those transition points was a significant predictor of performance on this task. Using the same task, but focusing instead on the modality of bodily movements, which we extract using a video frame differencing method, uh, we can look at how these are coordinated and end up pre predicting uh, performance. So we use a method here called cross-wavelet coherence. There's an example cross-wavelet coherence plot here, where high values show strong coordination, high uh, meaning warm colors, and cool colors here represent uh, low or no coordination. So what's important here is that we could see that, uh, in particular, uh, at two-second timescales and lower, bodily movement coordination during this task uh, for dyads was greater than expected due to chance and task demands. And in this case, uh, two seconds is about uh, a scale 16 and lower based on our sampling rate. So everything up here was greater than chance or task demands alone. But more importantly, for the function, we found that teams with high in-phase coordination at one second time scales uh, tended to perform better. But I also mentioned before that we're interested in how coordination changes over time. So if we look at the average coherence for each team across five periods within the task, we find that uh, during the beginning and the end of the task, 
low, medium, and high performance groups tend to perform about the same or tend to be coordinated about the same, but that the lowest performing teams actually have this uh, relatively stronger decrease in the amount of coordination. In my work, I'm hoping to advance a social coordination dynamics approach to collaborative cognition. And there's a couple of areas of opportunity in this field. We need to get better at incorporating multiple modalities into the research and analysis methods. Uh, we need to determine how coordination is different uh, in different modalities has a functional effect on that collaboration. We want to improve multi-scale detection of coordination and its changes, and also evaluate multivariate methods for coordination in larger teams. So I'm gonna go through a few examples of efforts towards addressing these aims. So one of these is actually not from my own work, but a really good paper by Cindy DeMello and colleagues, um, where they actually incorporated multiple modalities. So movements, uh, speech rate, and also this technological component. So uh, interaction in the user interface for a Minecraft programming task for uh, groups of three. They use a method called multidimensional recurrence quantification analysis. I don't have time to talk more about that today. Uh, but what they found actually was that uh, a form of coordination, which was essentially the temporal regularity, that less regularity predicted uh, collaborative problem solving processes such as constructing shared knowledge, as well as negotiation and coordination. But we need to get better at understanding what are the functions of coordination in different modalities and what kind of outcomes that we're interested in understanding do they relate to. So my colleagues and I did a systematic review of coordination dynamics in psychotherapy, where we found evidence in prior work on physiological coordination, movement coordination, interpersonal processes such as dominance or submissiveness displays, as well as properties of the language and speech. And that these all had some evidence of a relationship with the outcomes of therapy, like a symptom reduction, alliance in the relationship and empathy. And we'd like to see how, if we were to investigate this in a collaborative team context, how these different modalities would relate to things like collaborative outcomes, cohesion and trust, or establishing common ground. My colleague Aaron Likens and I are also working on a method for modeling time varying and scale localized coordination dynamics. What I'll say briefly about this method, uh, we have here two example complex sine waves where if we decompose the signal into the different component frequencies, we see that there's, for example, a period here where the signals have a matching uh, frequency content. And we see with our method that we can detect that this system moves in and out of secret, uh, synchrony at that particular frequency, whereas at the other frequencies that we expected, it remains relatively stable over time. So this provides a method for not only looking at one-to-one uh, -one synchronization, but also end to m which means uh, different phase relationships. And uh, this method is also based on an entropy calculation of the distributions of relative phase values in this uh, technique, a particular form of coordination. One last example, uh, my colleagues and I have also been looking at scaling up to larger team sizes using uh, rhythm badges, a type of sociometric badge, and only vocal amplitude data. Here, what we were able to do using a measure of dynamic complexity for each team member was identify when there were critical instabilities in the team interaction. Uh, some of these were known transitions like changes in the task, and other ones were unknown interaction transitions. And we show how there are actually changes in the network structure representing the amount of energy communicated uh, in the interaction and the amount of connections between people. So just to wrap up, uh, we're looking at how can we use these coordination measures to augment individual and team performance on a project focusing on uh, gaming and healthcare. And what's important is that we understand that social coordination dynamics are multi-scale we can use many methods to study them, but the focus is how can we see things in different modalities at different time scales and specify which form of coordination we're looking at and how it changes over time, ultimately so we can understand the collaborative function of coordination, whether that's a predictor of task performance or other outcomes or a comparison between the level of coordination and conditions and context. So I'd like to say thanks to Wayne Gray, Ray Perez, the symposium organizers, as well as my fellow panelists, and my many great collaborators. Feel free to contact me by email or on Twitter. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you.